have turned there, chapter 18, verses 2 to 7, let's read them. And I want to slow down on a couple places here so that you get the wording. Now, whenever you study the Bible, realize every single word is important. There's not one word in the Bible that's not important. And I'm going to kind of highlight a couple things, and you'll see why in a few minutes. But let's start at verse uh, 2, and we'll go to verse 7. It says, and he, talking about an angel, in verse 1, talking about the angel, says, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, and has become a habitation of devils. Now, this word devils, most of you would know, means demons, okay? A habitation of demons. And I want to say this right off the bat. Don't believe for a minute that the world is not saturated with demons today. They're everywhere. And you know, I've got to say, don't look to cover Satan up in anything, but look to reveal him in everything, because he's in everything and every walk and every part of your life. There's demons surrounding us. There's demons probably perhaps in this church tonight. They're going to do everything they can to confuse what I'm doing tonight. There's demons all over the world. And it says in the Bible time and time and time again that demons saturate the earth. And they're all around us. And we are fighting a spiritual warfare. We are fighting something that is greater than us alone. And we need God's protection. Amen? Now, it says that there are devils. Continuing on in verse 2. It says, And the hold of every foul spirit and cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now, I want to take note on this. It says, For all nations. Now, let me ask you again. What did it say? For all nations. All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fortification, and the kings of the earth have committed fortification with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. I want to stop here just for a second. Verse 4, When it's talking about my people, who's he talking to? Hmm? Us being... Now, one thing we need to know, and that's, that's a good answer, but one thing we need to know about the Bible in the book of Revelation, everything as far as prophecy that is being fulfilled in the book of Revelation comes from the Old Testament, not the New. In fact, you will find hardly any New Testament prophecies. Now, some people say they have found some, and it's argumentative, you know, whether it is a prophecy or whether it is not. But prophecies in Revelation come out of the Old Testament. So, if it's dealing with the Old Testament, what people is it dealing with? Hmm? The Jewish people. The Jewish people. Now, he says, come out of them, my people. Okay? Now, we would like to read Revelation and say that he's talking to the born-again Christians. Okay? Go ahead. Right? And that's part of my point. We're not here. So he's talking to those that will be here who are considered his people. And that is the Israelites. Okay? So I want, to, I want to make it real clear because you're going to see in a few minutes how that switched around. Now you say, where is that in the Old Testament? If you have a pen and you want to write this down, it's Jeremiah uh, 51 9. Okay? So you can go back and read it and show someone else later on who these people are. Now, verse 5 says, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. <clears throat> now, again, we're talking about who? And I've still got some codes, so y'all excuse me if my voice kind of gets crackly, okay? But uh, it's talking about a her, but again, what place is it talking about? Say it again, Nathan. What place is it talking about? What land? Babylon. Well, we're talking primarily about Babylon, though. And, and, yeah, talking about Babylon. So it's addressing Babylon as a her, a she. Why is the Bible addressing it as such a thing? Now, Nathan just got a new truck, and he may call it her, okay? And you can call the United States her, okay? Bumblebee, right? But it's kind of strange the way that he begins to talk about this place as a her. And from this point on, he will identify Babylon only as a her. Not a him, but a her. Now, who can tell me quickly who the founder of Babylon was? Anybody? Who? Nimrod. Nimrod. Okay? 
Nimrod was the founder of Babylon. Is Nimrod a woman? No. Now, if God is metaphorically speaking about a he or a she and talking about Babylon, why wouldn't he say he instead of her? There must be another person involved with Babylon. A more powerful person than actually uh, Nimrod was as founder and king of Babylon. And I want us to get that clear right up front here because we're about to go into something good here. Now, it says in verse 6, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her words. And the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. Now watch this. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Now, how many male queens do you know? None. So again, we're identifying the great whore here of Babylon. But it's not Nimrod, the founder of Babylon. It's talking about someone else. Who can tell me what Nimrod's wife's name was? Samaranas? Okay, and you had a question. I, I said, I, I was going to say a Roman Catholic church. Hang on to that. <laughs> Hang on to that. That is, like I said a while ago, that's a leaf on the tree. And this is the root, the foundation of what has created that leaf in that tree. And we're going to see how this has progressed through the years. And even as recent as this very moment that we're standing here, is she influencing today? Now, the Semiramis is Nimrod's wife. What is the story of Semiramis? Who can tell me a little bit of history on Semiramis? And I'm being facetious because, you know, not many people know. Now, if I was sitting in here with a stack of preachers that had doctor's degrees or something like that, theology or something like that, I could expect an answer. But most of us cannot answer that question. Who is Semiramis? Some of us have read a little bit about her, but do we know a lot about her? Unless you go into Jewish history, Josephus and Maccabees and different books that Jewish people have written, you probably don't know a lot about Semiramis. Tonight, we're going to talk about primarily her, the queen that sits not as a widow, Semiramis. And I want y'all to be prepared. I want you to be ready because this is good stuff. Amen? Now, if you got your Bibles, again, go to Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah chapter 47. We're going to read verses 8 and 9. Now remember, the prophecies in Revelation come out of what? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. So we need to remember that. Now, chapter 47, verses 8 and 9. See if this sounds familiar. It says, therefore, this is God speaking to Isaiah. It says, therefore, uh, hear now this, thou that, uh, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, uh, that sayest in thine heart, I am, uh, I am, and none besides me. Otherwise, I am as in like, I am God, I am the great creator, I am the beginning, I am a God, a goddess, if you will, especially the way this is being said. It says, says in thy heart, I am none uh, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment. God speaking about Semiramis in the Bible. Now, it says, in one day, the loss of children and the widowhood they shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. Now, if he was going to identify, if God is going to identify Semiramis personality, then I think in Isaiah he's pretty much done this. He's basically saying it's almost like witchcraft, the spell that she will have upon people of the world. Okay? Now, she is powerful. Nimrod He's a little bit powerful. But she took over from Nimrod and has done a lot more to this world than Nimrod had ever done. Now, Nimrod has set some things up that even today are affecting us in a very evil way. But Semiramis went much, 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 much further with the things that she had set up that's uh, affecting our world today in evil. In evil, okay? We're going to get into the meat of some of this stuff, but I want you guys to really, again, Pay attention. Now, Babylon basically has two founders. Two founders. 
<clears throat> and again, I got, I'm trying to apply the code here, so y'all excuse me. Has two founders because of their idolatry. Their idolatry. They're metaphorically against God. These two founders. Their whole purpose in history was to try to do away with God. Remember, Babel was built as a result of what? After the flood. The flood had happened. They had built a great tower. This tower was supposed to reach the heavens because they wanted to worship the heavens and also exalt themselves as gods and goddesses. In other words, Nimrod would be the sun god. Semiramis would be the moon god. Okay? Now remember, she's the what god? Say it, class. Moon god. Remember, that is her representation from the very beginning. Now, they built a shrine, basically, of anti-God. That's what they built. They built something that took people away from God and introduced people to gods, plural, and goddesses, little g. So basically, they, had to, they, were wanted, they had wanted to change the whole concept of who God was and what he had done. Remember, he had destroyed the world simply because of sin that had entered into the world. He basically wiped it out. But then he had Ham, Cush, and uh, Japheth that was on the, the ark. And basically Ham's son was the one that uh, had a son that had a son that had Nimrod. Remember Ham in, in Genesis. What was Ham known for? Somebody tell me. Hmm? He looked upon his pa uh, father's nakedness. In other words, he could have been a little bit homosexual. A little bit perverted. He was the wild child. He was the kid that... Uh, you know, ran wild, so to speak. And wouldn't it be just fit for him to have a great-great-grandson that would start all this trouble in the world of rebellion against God? Now, you had two founders, Nimrod and Semiramis. Now, Nimrod, we're going to talk about him first. His name means in Hebrew, to rebel. To rebel. Can somebody give me a sentence of what sin is? What is sin? Anybody? Huh? Rebelling against God, right? So the Hebrews decided they would name him the great sinner or the great rebeller against God. What is it that Nimrod done that was so horrible by building a tower? Is you know, in itself, it's not a big thing. And God changed the language. He confounded the language. He had changed the whole concept of everything they were doing simply because they had done something that was so evil and so wrong. Now remember, when you talk about God, God doesn't just look at the here and now. And sometimes that's why we have so much trouble with God. We say, well, God, I'm sick now. I'm broke now. I need money now. I need this. I need that. God looks at the big picture of things just like he did with Nimrod and what Nimrod was trying to start and what Nimrod was trying to create and what Nimrod was doing. He rebelled against God because God said, go through the world and multiply. Nimrod said, no. He said, I got a better plan. I'm going to build kingdoms and governments. Kingdoms and governments. Now, most people would say government's good. It does good things. It helps the poor. It does this, it does this, it does this. But I want to submit to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, government is one of the most evil things that's ever been created on the face of this earth. Amen. It was never God's intent. He actually built a government himself to counter the government that was built by Satan, which is Babylon. Government is evil. Now you say, Brother Morning, how can you say that? All government is evil. You know, recently, we had a gubernatorial race, and uh, what was his name? Pat McCory was running, and Cooper was running. The big thing that they were running on was whether or not transsexual men, homosexual men, or men in general could go into the bathroom of women, and vice versa. Now, I don't know about you, but why would the government, in the first place, why would the government want to get involved in such a crazy scheme of things? Amen? Scheme of things, such as homosexuality. Why would they want to get involved in that? Do you see what government does? It eventually evolves into what the devil wants to do. Slowly, step by step. Today in the United States of America, in every state in our union, homosexuals can get married. A woman can abort her children. She can abort a baby. 
It goes on and on and on and on. Government takes care of people who don't go to God and ask for help. So, Brother Marty, you're starting to meddle now. Well, I guess we'll have to meddle a little bit. But the fact is, God wants you to work. He wants you to earn your work. He wants you to stand up on your hind legs and do what you're supposed to do and not sit around and get handouts. But Marty, you're meddling. Well, I always had to meddle one until y'all throw me out of here. <laughs> but yes, sitting around, getting paid, and not doing anything to earn a living is wrong. Amen. It's wrong. Government sets up all these subsidized programs and entities and things that do things for people that help people that just don't want to work and are lazy. Now, they're killing babies. They're allowing homosexuals to be married. They're rewarding people that are lazy. Okay? And it goes on and on and on. So you do, do you see then why in Genesis 10 it talks about Nimrod being a great mighty hunter? What is it talking about? Is it that he took a bow and arrow, he'd go out and he'd shoot game? Yeah, he's pretty good at that. But fact is, the Bible's not talking about that. It was talking about the antagonism and the rebellion that Nimrod had for God, thus trying to hunt men's souls and take them away from God. You know, most people today in churches, they depend on government so much that they will vote against candidates who are pro-Bible. Do you hear me? They will vote against candidates who are pro-Bible. Simply because that candidate will reward them with a check of some sort. Or help them in this way, or help them in that way. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, that's not of God. When did the world stop depending on God? And I'm not talking about, we're all depending on God. I'm talking about depending on God. Depending on God, we can't pay our bills this week. And there are two. And we don't know what to do. Depending on God. God, my child is sick. God, I have cancer. Depending on God. Like there was no one else to help you in the way that God can help you. When did we stop doing that? When government started taking care of everything. You know, Christianity was the primary root of education. But now the government has taken control of, of education. And I know most of us have kids in public schools and all, but I'm going to say something tonight. It's real controversial. It's real controversial. And if you're a school teacher, I'm not throwing rocks at you. But I'm telling you, as far as the academic of what a school system is today, it would be better for our children to not go to school than to go to school and learn the ideologies that the schools are teaching them. They're, they're training a culture. They're not educating our children. They're training a culture of being what? Uh, respectable of others, like homosexuals, diversity. Now, I don't believe anybody should get picked on. I'm not, I'm not subscribing to that by no means. But ladies and gentlemen, when they try to force your children to accept homosexuality and make them, make them go to diversity classes to accept homosexuality, they are meddling. Right. It is not their job. It is not their place. They're rewriting history. They're doing all these things trying to create a new culture, a new generation for America that is totally against everything that God is. Now, I hope I haven't offended you, but I am going to tell you the truth. Amen. And that's my job. Amen? Now, he was called a mighty hunter because of his antagonism, his opposition of disobeying God. He creates governing kingdoms such as Babylon, or Babylon, if you will, Iraq, Akkad, Assyria. These are all kingdoms that Nimrod had created, governments, governments, if you will. And this was directly against what God had told them to do when they left the ark. He said, go out and multiply the earth, and let's have a haven. Let's have the world the way it will be when Jesus comes back and rules for a thousand years. Let's have the earth like that. Instead, they got involved in this. Nimrod and 
his wife, Semiramis, and created governments and taught people, look, don't depend on God for your happiness. Depend on me. I will deliver. I will give it to you just like they do today. Did you know churches were so big and so powerful in America at one time that they were the primary person to go to for some sort of welfare or help? Not the government. Churches. They would go out and feed the homeless and they would do things. And now churches can't even afford to do it anymore because nobody has no more interest in going to church. The government's taking care of us. We have all this entertainment. We have 10,000 things we need to do and want to do. But church, well, we'll put it somewhere on the list just to soothe our conscience a little bit about God. You hear me, folks? This is what Nimrod created. Now, Nimrod gave dependence on government. Is this the way of the devil? Is this what the devil wants? <clears throat> Absolutely. Got your Bibles? Go to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, verses 16 and 18. <clears throat> and to say my voice, I'm going to let Nathan read that out loud. He said, you caught me off guard. <laughs> 13, and uh, read verses 16 to 18. And he called us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he have that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for he is the number of a man, and his number is six so basically what Satan's going to do is set up a government that will take care of the world. No more dependency on God. If you want to eat, if you want anything, you're going to have to have this number 666. But you notice in the last verse how it says, be wise and understand that the number is 666. Which means it's not going to be necessarily a tattoo on your forehead, or on your right hand. It's probably going to be some kind of implant to your head or your forehead. I mean your uh, hand or your forehead that uh, identifies with the number 666. So we see then without this that you can't buy, sell, or trade. You can't do anything. In other words, you've got to give full dependency on the government. So from the beginning, Satan has wanted to create a world that depends primarily on him. Now he doesn't care if you call him Baal, Babylon, Nimrod, Semiramis. He don't care. As long as you're not calling God, God. In other words, he's going to win this way. In Isaiah chapter 14, he said, I want to exalt myself above God. I want to be better than God, bigger than God, stronger than God. And he's wanting to accomplish and achieve that through little subtle ways that we're not noticing. Now, I say subtle ways, but then again, they're obvious if we look at them. If we open up the Bible and we read them, and we open up our understanding, and we look at them, and we study them, they're in obvious ways of what the devil is doing. But the devil has made it so comfortable not to look at it that we don't want to look at it. Now, you can say, Brother Marty, you start in trouble. You better believe it. If I can make the devil squirm a little bit with truth, I want to do it. Absolutely I want to do it. I want him squirming all the time because I'm telling him, I'm shouting from the rooftops, I'm telling everybody his little secrets about government and no dependency on God. Now, again, I'm going back to what I said a while ago. You can tell when a person depends more on government than they do God because a good candidate might run for office and they won't vote for him because he's of the wrong party who will take away their check or give them less money. Primarily what they're doing, they're selling God out for that check. You see, that's not their only agenda to give you a check. Their agenda also is abortion, homosexual marriages, transsexual marriages, on and on and on and on. But the little bit of money that they're going to give a lot of people is enough for them to vote for them. Government is controlling us. And folks, it's time to wake up and realize it. And depend on God. In our churches, in our homes, in our lives, in our marriages, in our families. Depend on God. And not the government. Not the school system. Colleges, on and on, they have gotten so bad. So hard. That again, I would say, 
It would be better not even to send your kid to school, but to homeschool them or send them somewhere where there's a Christian education offered. Simply because of what they are teaching and the culture they are creating through their educational process. It's bad, folks. It's bad. I'm telling you it's bad. If you could go to high schools and hang out for a day, you would never want to see your child in that high school. It ain't like it used to be. The worst thing that I saw in high school was sneaking around smoking cigarettes. But now, they're having relations out on the floors in front of everybody. Girls on girls. Boys on boys. Mm -hmm. And it's not stopped. And it's not condemned. And it's everywhere, folks. Even in Bessemer City, Gastonia, Charlotte, and all across America. Governments ran schools. Now, that kind of gives us an idea of Nimrod and basically what he set up to be considered an evil for the world. But I told you a while ago, the real evil comes from his wife, Semiramis. Semiramis will later add to what Nimrod had done. He created governments and kingdoms. Semiramis came along after him, after he had died, okay, and she would add religion, religion. And this religion that she's going to create will absolutely finish what Nimrod had started as far as removing people from God by introducing other gods and worship. You see, remember, after the flood, the world was destroyed and all the evil people were gone. There were no more, save Noah, his wife, and the children. There was eight total on the ark, correct? They had children, they had children, they had children up to the time of Nimrod. Now, it should have been a new beginning. It should have been a new start to worship God and depend on God and trust God. But again, when they climbed on the ark, Satan got on the back of him and he went with him. And he started his mess all over again, starting the kingdom, if you will, of Babylon. Thus causing God to have to start a new kingdom, which is Israel through Abraham. Okay? Now, Semiramis went a step further and said, I'm going to add religion in this. If you're not yet stopped depending on God, then I'm going to give you something that will be total idolatry towards God. I'm going to give you a new religion. And I'm going to make it a very complex thing. In fact, I will get at least half, at least half of the world through what I'm going to create. And even still today, at least half of the world is following what Semiramis had started. Yep. You believe that, folks? Yep. Amen. Now think about that. It's over 3 billion people following what Semiramis had started. And we're going to figure all this out here in a second. Now, Semiramis claimed after Nimrod's death, remember he had died, that she was still a virgin, that she was still a Kind of like Mary was when she had Jesus, a virgin. I guess her marriage they didn't consummate. I don't know. But obviously she's lying. Okay? But she claims that she's a virgin still. And that Nimrod didn't die. He just went to heaven and became the sun god. Now, if Nimrod went to heaven and she's not a widow, okay? As she said in Revelation, she's not a widow. Then what did she become? A goddess. A goddess. Okay? Now, she being a goddess, him a sun god, and her a moon god, gave her the ability to run those kingdoms that Nimrod had started in any way that she wanted to, even as far as worship towards her and Nimrod. Government started. People now depending on it, the government. Now these government officials are claiming to be gods. And is that not what we think sometimes about, you know, whether you're Democrat, Republican, whatever you are, sometimes we think, well, if we get this man elected, if we get this person or woman elected, then yes, absolutely, everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be wonderful. Our country's going to be great. I'm telling you, folks, government's bad news. God is the way. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. There is no other way. 
And yes, we can find a window of opportunity and vote for a person to sustain morals. And we should do that. It is our obligation as Christians to vote for the right people as long as they are aligned as close as they can be to the Bible. I didn't say all the way perfect because you're never going to find that. But as close as we can get them. If they say, look, you know, I want uh, prayer back in schools. If they say I'm against abortion and uh, opponents say I'm against prayer in schools and I'm for abortions, then we should vote for the one that's, you know, against them. Amen? The one that is closely aligned to the Bible. Yes, we should do that. But we shouldn't put all our allegiance to that person and worship that person as we do God. God is God, and there is no other. Now, Nimrod set this up, and she's going to add something to it, religion. Not only are they going to take all your hopes and put them in one person, but now they're going to put all your spiritual faith in these people. Now, the moon god is Semiramis. Okay? And she began something that will last until this very moment that we're sitting in. And remember, we're talking about the Tower of Babel that long ago. And she was going to create something that was going to last until as we're sitting here tonight. She designed something with her, Nimrod, and Tomas. Tomas was her son. She said she had Tomas because the sun god, Nimrod, impregnated her through sunbeams. Okay? She got pregnant and she had Tomas. Now this is a counterfeit of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Satan knew God's plan way ahead. He knew what God was going to do and he tried to set up something that made it look less respectable for those who truly want to know the truth. In other words, if I am seeking religion, I want to know the truth. Which religion do I go to? And then I get into it real deeply and start studying it. And I see, well, look, this stuff about Jesus and Mary and all this, well, this is another form of what basically uh, Semiramis had done way, way back. And so I discard it. But the devil had to create a religion that would allow that to look like the situation. Okay? In other words, this looks like what basically Semiramis had started long, long ago. What is that religion? There's two in the world today, and I'm going to call them out here in just a second. Now, Tamaz was her virgin-born son, just as Mary had a virgin-born son. You see where I'm going with this? You see where I'm going with this? So the devil's creating something to cause a combogulation in your head, if you will. You know, this gives me doubt. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. It should strengthen. It should tell you, look, it is so important that we trust in Jesus Christ that the devil tried to counterfeit it long, long ago to discourage us of it being the true and the right way to go. In other words, he tried thousands of years ago to discredit it. But ladies and gentlemen, that just tells me that Satan knew that that was his demise. That's the only reason he would create such a plan. That tells me that I am on the right path. I know the way, the truth, and the life, and it is through Jesus Christ, simply because the devil has attacked it so vigorously. And I'm going to show you how vigorously here in just a second. Now, we wonder, does God ever mention this episode in the Bible of what I just described to you about Tamaz and, and uh, Semiramis and Nimrod? Absolutely. And a lot of people, Maybe have or maybe have not caught this. Sometimes you read the Bible and you don't understand some of it. You don't study it. You go on to the next chapter. Stop and study it. And you'll find things like I'm about to show you out now. Did God ever mention these things in the Bible? Absolutely. If you've got your Bibles, go to Ezekiel chapter 8. We're going to read verses 13 to 15. Verses 13 to 15. Ezekiel chapter 8. And I'm going to give you all a second to get there. And while you're getting there, I'm going to take some water. Ezekiel chapter 8. <clears throat> if you need more time, raise your hand. Whenever you find it, everybody look at me when you find it. 
Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13 to 15. Again, I'm going to give you time to get there so that you can mark it and know where it is. Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 13 to 15, it says, And he said also unto me, talking about God, talking to Ezekiel, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than they, that they do. That they do. Okay? Talking about a group of people, a plural group of people, correct? That they do. Alright? It says, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north. And behold, there sat a woman weeping for who? Amen. It says, Then said he unto me, Has thou seen this, O son of man? Stop here just a second before we go on. Has thou seen this, O man? In other words, God is asking Ezekiel, Have you seen what Tamaz and Semiramis and others have done in the past? Now, remember, Ezekiel's on the other side of this now, of what they had began. And God is asking him, Have you seen what they have done in the past? He's asking Ezekiel, Look, take note of these three, of what they have done in the past. It says, Has thou seen this, old man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. Now what that tells me is this, that no matter how bad they had been from the beginning of the Tower of Babel, Nimrod, Simeronus, Tomas, no matter how bad they had been, a greater abomination is coming for the future of what they had started from that time. In other words, it's going to progress. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. All the way up until the time of Revelation chapter 18 of the great whore in the Bible talking to the Jewish people. When the Christians are gone, it will still be going on and it will still be infiltrating the world. What they had begun. He's telling Ezekiel, take a look at this. But see a greater abomination coming one day. Now, folks, that would wake me up if I were Ezekiel. Amen? And I would say, look, something big is getting ready to happen. But what's getting ready to happen? Now, what Simeramus and Tamaz had already done was basically started idol worship all over again after the great flood. In other words, they had reintroduced sin and rebellion into the world. Nimrod had built the kingdom for them to do it with, and then they created this new abomination or idolatry towards God, the greatest sin of all. Worshipping other gods. Worshipping other gods. You have no hope in that. So it is the greatest sin of all in my opinion. If you do not worship Jesus Christ, you have no hope. None. Zero. The devil knows this. So this is what they have already done. Now, let's say, for the sake of being generous, that there were 50 million people on the world during that time of Ezekiel. Okay? Now, a greater abomination would mean millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of more people. Even billions of people. Because when God says a greater abomination, He uses the word greater. He doesn't do it accidentally. He's saying something big is getting ready to happen. And we're going to go through it. We're going to look at it. Now, what exactly is bigger than what they had then? Again, I'm going to say it. At least half of the world's population today worshiping this idol worship that they had created. You're looking at over 3 billion people. In this moment that we're sitting here, there's a Bob in this type of idol worship. This type of idol worship. To me, that's bigger because the world is more populated now than it's ever been in the history of the world. And over half the world is worshiping idol worship because of what they had started. So I think he spoke real clear and real plain to Ezekiel. For a day such as today, for us to understand what he was telling Ezekiel, we would have to live today to see it. And folks, we are in that day and time when such a thing can happen as chapter 18 in the Bible of Revelation. Yeah. We're living in such a day. So the only thing that we need to worry about at this point is, are we born again Christians, and are we going to go in the rapture before these things happen? Because after the rapture, you're in trouble. 
You're in trouble. You've got to be born again before the rapture. Now, if half the world is deceived, you've got to ask yourself a question. Am I? Do I know for sure? Do I understand completely in my heart, in my mind, what I have to do to be saved? The devil makes it real difficult. Real difficult. As much as he can. Now, I said half the world's population. Half the world's population. Now, half of that half is going to be indirectly. And half of that half is going to be directly involved in this idol worship that Simbaramas had started. Now, Simbaramas, what god did she represent? The what goddess? Moon goddess. Moon goddess. All right? There was a traveling salesman that went from where the Kaaba is in Saudi Arabia. Okay? He went from that area up to Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is the area where Iran, Iraq is, or basically where Semiramis had started this religion. And he would travel and he would take goods from one place to the other, back and forth. Now, when he was up in Mesopotamia, he got involved in this new worship, or what they thought was new worship. Because remember, down to Kaaba, they had over 360 gods, polytheistic, many gods. Okay? They had this many god worship. Well, he picked up on this moon god worship, decided that when he went back to Saudi Arabia, because of the mentality of the men, that he was going to have to change this into a male god image. And he would call it Huba, or Hubel, H-U-B-A-L-L. -L. Okay? Now, he said, I'm going to have to do this simply so they will accept it. And maybe they will put it as a representation with a stone inside the Kaaba with other gods. Well, they decided, yeah, I think we can do that. We ain't got a moon god, so we'll throw a moon god in there. What did you say his name was? Hubba? Okay, we'll, we'll put him in there. We'll put a black stone there to represent him in the Kaaba. Well, then a man come along many centuries later, later named Muhammad. Muhammad said, wait a minute. He said, my family and all said, uh, you know, we, uh, we're real partial to Hubba, the black stone, the moon god. In fact, that's the only god we worship. That's the only one we will worship. We're not going to worship any other gods. And I think it would be better for everybody to worship just one god. And we will call him hmm, Allah. Allah is an Arabic term, and it means chief god. Now, if you've got a chief god, obviously, then you've got to have a polytheistic religion, correct? Many gods, because you can't have a chief god if there ain't many gods to be the chief over. Now, Islam's, I mean, Muslims will tell you that Islam is a single god religion, that you Christians are the ones that worship polytheistic religions. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They will argue tooth and nail with that. But they don't realize that their creation came from a polytheistic religion environment. And then Muhammad said, well, look, I'm going to call it one God. It's going to be Habal, and it's going to be Allah, our chief God. Now, they kind of rejected that. They said, no, so you're going a little too far. So we're not going to do that. So he went back to Medina, which is outside of Mecca. He got 10,000-man army. He brought a 10,000-man army back to Mecca, and just about wiped it out, destroyed it. Now, at that point, he submitted Allah, or Habal, as chief god. And ever since then, they have worshipped that moon god. Now, let me ask you a question. If you look on television, you see an Islamic flag or an ambulance going down the road. What is the symbol that you see on the side of it? Huh? A crescent moon. So they are directly worshipping this moon god. They changed the pretense a little bit. Says so a male, says so a female. Does the devil care? No, the devil don't care. Just worship something besides God, Jehovah. Don't worship the God of the Jews. Just don't worship Him. You can call it a man, a woman, whatever you want to call it. Just don't worship that other God. Now, in the world today, there's 1.2 billion Muslims. That's a whole lot of Muslims. That's a whole lot of people. Amen. Now, that in itself is at least half of the people that are worshiping the pagan religion. But there's another religion that is indirectly worshiping this mentality, this false idol worship, this moon god. Okay? The indirect, they're under a powerful, powerful deception. And it's a strong one. 
want to show you some things tonight that will set you with a moon god worship simply by its symbolism. I'm going to show you some things on the slides up here. The first thing we're going to look at, Tracy, if you will, is different religions of the moon goddess. These are actual pictures and statues and stuff that was from the time of Babylon all the way up until today. Now, who's this? Somebody tell me who this is up here. Well, the Catholic Church says it's Mary and Jesus. Now, what's Mary and Jesus sitting on? I'll go to the next slide. All right, this is a Roman version, okay, of Semiramis. What she got on her forehead? Go to the next picture. <laughs> this thing is creepy, is it not? I mean, that looks like something you just don't want to run into at night, all right? This was actually from Mesopotamia area, but what she got on her forehead? What she got, huh? A moon. Next picture. Speak up, everybody. This in itself is Semiramis. This is her court coming to her. She's sitting in the chair. What is it that's beside her up here? Shut, right there. Moon. That was from the beginning. Okay? Is there another one? Can't see that anymore. But anyway, go to the next one. This is Diana. You got to break it down a little. Can you break it down? Can you see? Well, I don't know if I can see. Can y'all see that moon above her head? Yeah. Okay, that's more of a Greek simulation of Semiramis. Okay, so you're taking from the Tower of Babel to the Greek Empire to the Roman Empire, all the way up to today's empire. Okay, so you see that this moon god worship, same as Allah with the Muslims, but in a different form, the original form of a female instead of a male deity. All under this moon god imagery. Now, this itself is Assyria, and right above it, I don't know if y'all can see where she's got the arrow, another crescent moon. All the Assyrians worshiping the moon god. Again, just after the time of Babylon. So this is the progression of where it's been through through the ages. Now, go to number two, which is Mary Crescent. You say, Brother Marty, is it really still going on today? Showed you one, but I'm going to show you a lot more. Double click. Yes. All right, go to the middle one. What is she standing on? Speak up. Go to the right one. What is she standing on? Go to the next slide. What is she standing on? Go to the next one. What is she standing on? Yeah. Next one. Down there to the right. What is she standing on? Yeah. Solid gold and silver with diamonds in it. A Catholic emblem. All right. Next one. What is she standing on? Yeah. Represented as the queen of heaven. All right. Same thing Simran's called herself. What is she doing here? What's in front of her? Yeah. Boom. Next one. Next one. What is this? Did y'all ever see these before? No. Next one. I guarantee you've seen these before. This is a statue, a solid gold statue in Rome. Okay? See the moon behind it? Go to the next one. Look at this one. There's a baby with it. Hmm. Next one. Just like Tamaz, huh? Again, a crescent moon. Next one. We'll go through them quick. Again, a crescent moon. Queen of Heaven. Next one. Again, crescent moon. Again, crescent moon. I don't know if you can see it on the bottom. Next one. Solid gold statue in Rome. Again, on top of uh, one of the Vatican buildings. Solid gold Mary holding Jesus. Crescent moon. And again, a crescent moon. Next. And again, a crescent moon. But this time, angels around her. Again, the queen of heaven. Go back. Again, queen of heaven showing the symbols around her head. All right, next one. Again, same thing. Now, this one's almost scary. This is Mary. What is she holding in her hands? A crescent moon. 
You get the point, guys? You see what I'm talking about? I'm trying to put everything we've said together, together. I mean, everything I've said, put it together now. Next. Again, that's where we begin. Now, you say, well, Brother Marty, those are old paintings. Those are old statues. They were from way back. Maybe they don't do that anymore. Maybe it's different now. Go to the Pope. Anybody recognize that color? Yeah. All right, bring it up bigger. Magnify glass over. Yeah. I move it up. Ready? More. All right, stop. What is Mary standing on there? Now, bring it back down a little bit so you can see who it is up there on his hat. Mary. Still today. Still today. The Catholic Church has 1.3 billion people. Put them together. Now, there are others. There's Isis and others. There's Indian goddesses, moon goddesses. And it goes on and on and on. Now, I say at least half the world's population. But I dare to tell you tonight, probably more like three quarters of the world's population. In fact, I would say the true born-again Christians, as the Bible says, as Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. The true born-again Christians, I would dare to say, probably don't represent eight or ten million people in the world today. There's no study one way or another to show it or to prove it. But I'd say eight or ten million people out of, what, almost seven billion people in the world. That's just a drop in the bucket. And folks, I'm not making this up. You saw the pictures. And you saw what the Bible said. And you know that it's talking about a time to come in the near future. But we're seeing it today take a greater abomination as Ezekiel was told back years ago. Now, this is the perfect time for Christ to return. This is it. Now, what about Revelation chapter 13? We're just talking about buy, sell, and trade. Perfect time, is it not? Go in other parts of the Bible. The only things that Jesus talked about. Now, I said there were no real true prophecies in there, but Jesus gave some indications of things that would be going on. Not necessarily prophecies, but events that would be going on during the time of the latter days, if you will. Wars and rumors of wars. Do you know right now there are more wars and rumors of wars in the world today than there, there's like two times more than it was during the Second World War? And how hard would it be to create a system, if you will, of no buy, sell, and trade? Huh, easiest thing in the world. You know what they're doing in the jails and the prisons now? You go to a canteen and they got a card. They can cut that card off anytime they want to on that computer. And guess what you don't get? You don't get no canteen. They call it a punishment. You pay $10. And then you also get your canteen ticket. They're controlling the population by doing that. Now, there's a thing called the beat chip. I don't know if it's going to be the mark of the beast. I don't know. We just don't know yet because it hasn't been revealed. And no man knows the day or the hour. I'm not saying it's going to be tomorrow. I don't know. But I know the Bible says it's going to happen. But there's a thing now called the beat chip. Maybe they'll progress and make it better. But you put that beat chip in you, it will open the doors on your, on your house, the locks on your car. It will uh, scan your account in the bank. In fact, in Washington uh, State, they're buying their groceries with it. It's smaller than a rice grain, and it goes into the hand. Okay? Now, the Bible says right hand or forehand. Why? Let's say, oh, it says in. Right hand or forehead. Why? Well, the right hand is the one mostly used. I know there might be some southpaws in here, but it's mostly the right hand that people use. Now, in the event your right hand's cut off, you put it in the head. Or an amputation has happened, something like that. Well, if you get your head cut off, it ain't going to matter anyway, is it? So it's the last result. But they have the technology now to do it. And one more thing that the V chip can do it can scan you within 10 feet anywhere in the world. No matter where you're at. Now, what does that mean? That means they have eliminated crime and made it a haven, if you will, a perfect world. How? If 
terrorist cannot commit terrorist acts and run and hide in the caves and the mountains because we can go get them. Guarantee you they ain't going to want to commit them. What good is it? I can't go sell drugs because they know I'm selling them. Well, they're going to find me. You see what I'm saying? You take cash out of this situation. If I can't sell drugs for cash, what can I sell them for? You know, food stamps? I don't know. Take his house. I don't know. You can barter and trade, but they know who the drug dealers are. It's just a matter of catching them. You see what I'm talking about? If Satan were to implement such a program as what he's talking about, what God or John's talking about in chapter 13 of Revelation, it would make the world a wonderful place for a time. And then Satan's going to reveal himself for what he really wanted from Isaiah chapter 14, and that is to be worshipped. Now, he has already the religions in place to do it. You know, we were over in Israel, and I talked to a lady at the Temple Institute where they're getting ready to build the temple on the Temple Mount. They said, we're ready to build it. And I said, well, what are the possibilities? What are your options? What is it you're thinking about doing? Here's what she told me. She said, we don't know why we couldn't build a mosque for who? Islamists, okay, Muslims. Build a mosque, a cathedral for the Catholics, and a temple on the Temple Mount. Now, if Satan wanted to implement something like that, he's got everything incorporated, doesn't he? And it could be done. The Temple Institute's already studying a way of doing that. Now, if the Temple Institute's already studying a way of building a temple on the Temple Mount, what's that tell us? That we're on the threshold of being raptured out of this world if we're born again Christians. Or we're on the threshold of being left in a rapture and condemned. Folks, you're living in exciting times if you're a born-again Christian. But you're living in very scary times if you're lost. Right. Satan has created a tapestry of deceptions that is so confusing. A thousand scholars and theologians couldn't figure it out. You see, all these religions and things and Catholicism and, and, and Islam and all these things stem from one root, Samaritans. And all these little religions are, are little leaves that come off that big oak tree of that root that, that began so many years ago. But there's only one way you're going to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. He was so bold as to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. No man comes to the Father but by me. 